Why did Brooke find Kakeshi dolls in the castle basement at Flower Capital? The same type of dolls we know Tenguyama collects. Who was Hawkins referring to when he prophesied that a certain man only had 1% chance of surviving by the end of the raid? If you're caught up with the latest chapter in One Piece, then you already know the answers to these questions. And I do certainly hope that you are caught up on the series because these last couple of chapters have truly been magnificent to follow. Containing big news, crazy developments, and incredible incredibly heartwarming moments, and perhaps most notably, insane revelations. Because throughout the Wano arc, and especially in these last couple of chapters, we've received a whole lot of answers to questions we've been asking about Wano or events related to Wano for literally years. Questions we've been waiting to see resolved since the beginning of the Wano arc or even earlier before we even arrived at Wano. In fact, we even got answers to questions we didn't even know we should be asking. So such as, where on earth is the ancient weapon Pluton? But while it's true that there have been a ton of revelations dropped on us as of late, it's also true that there are still a lot of mysteries that Oda hasn't solved for us yet. And this is despite the fact that the Wano arc is really, really, really soon to wrap up. Which is why, my friends, that is exactly what you and I will be exploring in this video. Questions that we still need answering by the end of Wano. Warning. This video will contain spoilers up to chapter 1053. You've been warned. Hello, Manaka Matachi. This is Joy Girl. And as my name suggests, I am generally a joyful girl. Especially where One Piece is involved. One Piece is generally a series that's successful in making me feel hyped and giddy and excited. You know, all sorts of really positive emotions. At times, it also does cause me pain, heartache. I've cried more times following the series than I care to admit. But... Something in particular that does not spark joy is unresolved mysteries. It has me questioning, confused, unable to sleep, unable to concentrate on anything else, constantly wandering at the back of my mind. But rather than the advice of Japanese organizing consultant KonMari, we're going to listen to Japanese mangaka Eiichiro Oda. And instead of discarding all of these exasperating mysteries which do not spark joy, we are going to gather and hoard all of these questions instead. But speaking of things that don't bring me joy, I'm also going to admit that you, you unsubscribed viewer, that does not bring me joy. But I'm not going to discard you, I'm going to embrace you and welcome you with the opportunity to subscribe to this channel and bring both of us said joy. So please, unless you want to change my entire YouTube identity to sad girl, please help me retain my joyful existence and click on that subscribe button. All right, questions. So many questions. Firstly, questions regarding Wano Kuni itself. As an isolationist country teased from since the thriller Bark arc, the land of Wano has been a very intriguing source of mystery and after almost 150 chapters and essentially four years spent within the Wano arc, would you believe it? Wano Kuni still remains a bloody mystery. For example, as the arc progressed and we got introduced to more and more characters, a question we began to wonder is how do so many of the Wano citizens have devil fruits? As an isolated country, how did they get access to such devil fruits? And does this suggest something further, such as Wano being somehow related to the origin of devil fruits, similar to how they're intricately related to the Poneglyphs being the ones who created the Poneglyphs. And surely it wouldn't be to that extent because if it was the case, then surely we would have been told of that by now. And Kaido wouldn't have had to rely on artificial devil fruits if he had access to original devil fruits. But it does certainly seem plausible that they do have some sort of deeper connection to the devil fruits because they do seem to be closely connected to all the deeper lore concerning the ancient kingdom and the void century. Speaking of which, it's crazy that we still don't know what this lore exactly entails. Why did the Kazuki clan decide to close Wano's borders all those centuries ago? And why is it important that they prepare for Joy Boy when he arrives? And also, why 
is it that Momonosuke still finds it too early to open up Wano's borders now, despite Joy Boy having arrived? What even is the significance of Wano? Why was it once called the Land of Gold? These are questions that I expected to have been resolved by the end of the Wano arc. And while it's still possible that we will get the answers soon after we return from the break, it's also very well possible that Oda will now draw these out to be revealed in future arcs instead as we unveil more about the deeper lore within the series. Which seems to be the case in relation to the significance of Momonosuke as well. Ever since Zou, when we witnessed the young boy command Zunisha, it was obvious that there was something special about him. This proved to be more so throughout the Odin flashback and then pretty much confirmed during the raid once Momo read his father's journal. And now... Apart from the fact that we don't yet know why Momo has decided not to open up Wano's borders, we also don't know what about Momo makes him so important that an ancient creature like Zunisha would follow his orders. But Momonosuke isn't the only one in his family with special powers because his mother Toki also remains a mystery. Okay, granted, her powers are explained through her devil fruit, but still, she's quite the mystery nonetheless. Although it's been suggested through Odin's letter that Toki has also been searching for the dawn, as in she's also waiting to see the day when the world will be overturned. We never really found out exactly how much she knew about the happenings of the Void Century and why exactly she was on this mission to return to Wano. All of these, part of the reason why I was so heavy on the Toki is Alive ship. And don't get me wrong, I still am, because this arc doesn't seem to be over quite yet, but I will concede that it's not looking great for us right now. But in saying that, Tsukiyaki's reappearance appeared after being presumed dead for 20 years, and if another thing has given me hope, it's the confirmation of Hawkins's 1% man actually referring to himself and not DS Drake as the anime suggested. And why I bring this up is because when the anime added this part in, I was very confused and even made a video about whether that moment should be considered canon because the anime team were privy to information that we weren't, or whether they were taking liberties with the story and filling in gaps with their own interpretation. And the anime has filled in these sorts of details a few times throughout the Wano arc. One of which was the scene from chapter 979 where we see a shadowy figure following Robin and Jinbei around. And I've long speculated that this figure may possibly be Toki who is, yes, still somehow alive. But then the anime went ahead and showed us that this mystery figure is actually Yamato. But given that they got it wrong about Hawkins' prediction, it's also possible that they got it wrong about Yamato following Robin and Jinbei. And that's all I'll say on the matter because I don't want to seem even crazier and high on copium than I already must, but it is just some food for thought. Anyways, regardless of whether Toki is alive or not, the questions surrounding her character and all the related lore is definitely intriguing. And another potentially lore-heavy discussion is that of the layout and geography of Wano Kuni. Wano is obviously a country with very unique geography. Its elevation, the waterfall, and the different seasons in each region has sparked a very popular idea that Wano is actually made up of different islands puzzled in together to make shift a country. But mainland Wano isn't the only bizarrely unique landmass that we've encountered in this arc, because its additional island Onigashima is just as equally intriguing. From the skull dome which resembles the skull of an oni, to the gigantic katana at its entrance. Even the hint that it was previously called something different decades ago. Onigashima contained so many elements that made it so rich that the island itself had so much character, rather than existing simply as a location. And now that the arc is almost over and the raid on Onigashima has concluded, it begs the question, were all of these intricate details part of a larger story and a larger mystery, or was it simply to bring the surroundings to life and add to the richness of the location. But moving on from questions surrounding the lore of Wano Kuni itself to questions and mysteries surrounding the antagonist of the arc. And I do believe that the first question that pops up into everyone's minds is the full extent of Kaido's backstory. I know we did get quite a few glimpses into Kaido's past, but I think for most people it wasn't quite enough to satisfy all our burning questions on what has made Kaido the jaded, bitter alcoholic 
Nick that we now know him to be. Yeah. Because I do certainly think that there is more to Kaido's story, especially concerning the God Valley incident. And for that same reason, this may be another one of those reveals that Oda is saving to bless us with later down the track. But there are some specific questions related to Kaido's history unrelated to God Valley that I have really been curious about. As have you, I imagine. For example, who is Yamato's mother? And I suppose we shouldn't be surprised that we're in the dark about this because Oda doesn't have a great track record in exploring maternal figures in his series. But it is a question that I am still wondering nonetheless. But a question that I've been asking for even longer and still don't have an answer to is what is the story behind the numbers? I've been mentioning this puzzle in my video ever since Big Mom made a flyaway comment that Kaido bought the numbers from Punk Hazard. And I don't know, I've just always found it a very curious detail that Kaido would strike up such a deal. I mean, did he buy them from Vegapunk? What sort of experiments are they? And another burning question that I was sure would have been answered by now, where is the road poneglyph in Kaido's possession? This is something that I do feel will be revealed pretty damn soon, especially as we dive into lore-heavy territory territory based on what we saw in chapter 1053. But something that I've been interested in even more than finding the rolled poneglyph ever since the Whole Cake Island arc is when are we going to find out what all the other poneglyphs that we've found so far say. The last chapter only reminded us of how crucial the information contained on poneglyphs are. And there are so many of these artifacts that we've found since the Whole Cake Island arc that Robin's head must be going crazy with excitement. Moving on to another straw hat who has been embroiled in mysterious developments in this arc, Zoro. Speculations connecting Zoro's lineage somehow being connected to Wano started before we even got to the Wano arc, which of course only intensified as we continued progressing through the arc, and this is something Oda deliberately teased us with through revelations dropped in SBS volumes. And he has now obviously expanded upon this to at least explain that the Shimotsuki village where Zoro grew up in East Blue was founded by Kozoburo, a member of the great renowned Shimotsuki family. But there are still speculations that this is still not the full story. Primarily because of the close resemblance between Zoro to some of the Shimotsuki family members like Ryuma and Ushimaru. They look so damn alike that you'd be crazy not to think that Zoro may be a Shimotsuki member himself. So this is something that I would love to be delved into further, although I'm not sure how likely that is because Oda did mention in his SBS response that this plotline would only be minor in the series and won't affect the overall story, so I'm just not sure how much he wants to invest into this. And that isn't the only mystery where Zoro is concerned, because now with recent events, I say recent, but even this is old news now, we also have the question of what was that little moment we witnessed with Zoro facing what seemed to be a grim reaper. It was such an unexpected moment that we cut away from as quickly as we saw it, never to be mentioned again. Maybe we'll see fleshed out later in the story as we see Zoro go through a healing arc? Or is it related to something else? Maybe Enma. It is called the Lord of the Underworld after all. And maybe this is something we'll see explained as we see Zoro learn to control Enma better. You know, finding out that Enma did in fact test Zoro to see whether he was strong enough to survive after wielding its powers and now has deemed him worthy of being its owner. Nonetheless, this is an extremely exciting time for Zoro fans because whatever it is, it's a setup for something that will surely impact our favorite swordsman in a big way once Oda decides to reveal this plot point, whatever that is. And like I said, this is a new mystery that we now have as a result of developments that we saw quite late in the Wano arc. And Oda continues to drop these in even up until the latest chapter. I mean, now we're dealing with where exactly is Pluton? How has Wano been hiding it? Or even what's going to happen with Ryokugyu's presence at Wano? The latter of these two questions, which might actually tie in quite nicely to a mystery I've been wondering about since act one of Wano. How are we going to see Hawkins's prediction about Luffy only having a 19% chance of survival one month 
month from now. And in retrospect, this never had to necessarily concern Wano, but my expectation was that this meant Luffy and the Straw Hats would be staying at Wano for at least a month, which could still happen because now they're at their three-week mark, but it could be more of an indication of what happens in the next arc, potentially something that we're thrusted into due to this Admiral. And now for some other unsolved mysteries, those concerning the outside world outside of Wano, but were still introduced to us during this arc. What is the future of DS Drake and Sword given what's happened during the raid? I mean, Drake's cover was blown, your Kugu is here now, what's going to happen to him? Where even is he right now? And of course, there's still the question of what happened at the Reverie, which seems to be close to the top of everyone's minds. And Oda seems to be aware of this fact. I'm gonna guess that's why he teased us with that poster of Sabo in the background of that random town. And it might be a simple detail, but it's actually huge because the last time we heard of Sabo, he was seemingly involved in a massive event that made those who knew him shocked and weep. So to see this teeny tiny update gives us a hint that somehow Sabo is either being celebrated or mourned. The latter seeming like the more likely scenario due to all of the reactions that we saw. But also, what ended up happening to the rest of the Shichibukai? I mean, we've seen what's become of Buggy, but what about an update on the rest of them? And actually, on that note, are we going to get an updated bounty for all the Straw Hats? I mean, come on, Morgans, you didn't find out about the rest of the crew? Anyways, those are all the questions that I have for now, which, mind you, is still quite a lot. And these are just mysteries connected to the Wano arc or questions I expected to be solved within the Wano arc. And it has been suggested that once we return from the break, we will be entering the new saga. So it really does seem like there aren't many more chapters that we can expect in the Wano arc. So I do wonder how many of these questions will be left to be resolved in future coming arcs. But for now, let me know your expectations on these unresolved mysteries and whether I've missed any by leaving a comment below. Don't forget to like and share the video and please do subscribe for more One Piece discussions. You can also join our Joy Fleet Discord server or even become a Patreon member. And I do want to thank all our patrons for help supporting the channel. This is Joy Girl and I'll see you again soon.